Welcome to the Deal Champs podcast. I am your co-host, Strat Daddy. We have the master of hair with the hair out today. We have Sleepy Dean, oh, aka damn. Mr. <laughs> Captain America. He's coming back. He's working his way back to being a great American. Me and Jason laid out our terms of what it's going to take for him to get his nickname back. We didn't get it this week. We'll see what he comes with next week. In okay, order for Dean Rogers to get Captain America back, he has to come trumped out to the gills. Full <laughs> suit tie, blue suit. <laughs> Ready to win the over. debate. Oh, with God. the hand uh, like this, the whole thing. Guys, oh, let me tell you. <laughs> but my name is Stratton Brown. I have scaled two different companies to seven figures using virtual assistants. Right now, I'm on a seven-figure challenge, wholesaling houses. I'm live streaming every day to show you guys exactly how I'm doing it. It has been an absolute grind, and all of the lessons that I'm learning are going to be immense for anybody who tunes in. And we own a seven-figure real estate portfolio. And I got started from nothing, just playing football, and I worked for another guy. And then here I am today, like five, six years later. We have the master of hair, Mr. Jason Pritchard. Hair's out. Re the Resimply swag is on too. Shout out to Shanae. She sent over some uh, some Resimply swag. I like her a lot. This is your other uh, co-host, guys. It's Jason Pritchard. Backstory on me is I worked in corporate America for 15 years, hated my job, quit in 2014, burned all the boats, and have not looked back since. In the last 10 years, we've done 450 plus deals. We own a rental portfolio just north of 100 units here in Central California. And our goal with this pod every single week is to try to transfer as much useful advice, our experience to you guys that are listening in. So you do not have to make the same mistakes as we did and get to where you want to go as fast as possible. Okay, here he is. Let me turn down my <laughs> AC real quick. Let me turn down my AC. So everybody Start can. sweating. <laughs> we have Sleepy Dean, Mr. Dean Rogers. Welcome to the show. We're glad we have you. Mr. Sleepy Dean, please give us an intro. Yeah, about so yourself. good to have me. So guys, your other co-host, Dean Rogers, uh, started my career in the NFL. Then I transitioned to corporate and then into real estate. Been investing in real estate for over a decade now in Central California. Uh, we've done over 650 deals. Uh, we're on pace to break records. We did another 20 deals locked up in the month of June. Uh, really fired up about setting new standards. We had 20, 22 deals in June. Um, our rental portfolio keeps growing. It's eight figures. Uh, coaching students um, how to get started in real estate and grow and scale their businesses with wholesaling. And you guys can always connect with me at deanrogers.com. I think we all had big Junes. You did. We had, June? June was hitting, dude. We had a solid June as far as contracts for us. And then Dino got a 20. I know, Jason, you ended up like 170 in rev. Yeah, 170 in rev against like 57,000 in expenses. So very profitable month for us. Right, um, and 12, 12 contracts. So that was uh, the most that we've ever done. Prior to that, we hit 11 Heck yeah. uh, earlier this year. So we did 12. So our bonus, this is the, listen to what we're doing today at five. So I, you turned me on to all in podcast, Strat, And like on one or two episodes ago, they had some guy go on and they did a hand to blackjack for like 10 Bro, grand. Epic. It was awesome. And I it loved it. And so the, the challenge that we made for the team was if we hit 12 contracts, Scott and Cade, we're going to go up to table mountain and I think we're taking a thousand bucks and they're going to go put it on a hand of blackjack. And if we win, we're going to go send the funds out to the sales team in the Philippines and have them do something nice. So today at five, we're having, <laughs> we're having Scotty and Kane go free roll a thousand dollar hand of blackjack. I think right now later, dude. So that'll be pretty cool. If we uh, win, I'll share the clip on my, uh, I'll share the clip on my, uh, my Instagram. What are the statistics on that? Is it, is it more likely higher odds to win playing blackjack or is it higher no. wins to do red or black on roulette? What's, what's the higher odds? I think roulette gives you better odds. Blackjack is like the worst game to play because no matter what, over time you lose. Like the house always wins. In I think the house always wins on there. And I'm not a gambler at all. It is so a casino. That's why Scotty right? and so the house are doing always that. wins. I, I thought, depending on the player's skills, they had better odds at blackjack. But I thought for I me, heard it was that just too. Something fun to do. Yeah, I thought blackjack was higher odds. I was listening to a pod about it the other day. And you can be like, because Dana White's a degenerate, right? And he goes, yeah. falls to the wall, wants to play like million dollar hands. Really? And I guess you can, yeah, yeah like he's insane, bro. 
but I guess there's only so much skill to where like you're still there's still a decent amount of luck in there to where at least with poker you're going against like some other people. Yeah. And you can just kind of pull an over on them. But I, yeah. I don't know. I'm not a huge blackjack guy. Same. I've yeah. never liked gambling because it just feels like it's out of my control. Like if I'm playing a sport, it's in my control. If I'm in business working on deals, it's in my control. But like I feel like I'm literally just taking hard earned money and just like throwing it out there and just seeing what happens because I'm just I'm just not passionate about it. I know others are and they love it and get a huge thrill from it, but it's just not for me. Yeah. But I get a charge out of doing deals in business. That's what I get my charge out of the, I, the gambling. I get enough anxiety from my life. Me. Yeah. Yeah. I don't I don't need to go gamble. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I have so that's much a lot anxiety from day to day. I don't oh, need yeah. to go cause more anxiety yeah. at two AM. Yeah. Out of you know what's funny swings, about that? Dude, I can't go with it. Dude, so we'll we'll work on deals, right? We we invest into our business, and some people might call that a gamble. Like, oh, you're investing into marketing, right? And you're spending a thousand bucks on marketing. Let's just say that's risky. Is you're going to get it back? If I'm, you know, we spend tens of thousands of dollars on marketing every month, just in marketing. But if I go play something at the casino for a hundred bucks, like my stomach's in knots. Like I just feel sick. I'm like, ah, I don't know. It's a hundred bucks. Like It just doesn't feel right. Cause I just, again, I just don't have the control. So it's like scary to me. Same, same, same. Well, I'll report right, back so next week on our winnings and we'll see yeah. what you guys know what happened. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm excited to know. Do you know what is the first question? I won't be able to ask the question. All right. So first question today is what to do when a, a deal goes south. So you be in this business long enough, you're going to have deals that go south, go sideways, go backwards, um, every which way. And if you're not ready for that, it can really take you by surprise and knock the wind out of your sails and be a huge um, momentum killer. It can be a huge... Uh, um, you know, like energy suck and it can really just bring you down. Um, mm -hmm. I know that we've had several deals just in this past week that have gone sideways and that's an energy suck. And I've, I've had to step in and help out on some of those. And we've talked about it a little bit on some of our calls that we've had. Um, so yeah, I think it's a really tricky thing. Uh, Strat, what do you think when a deal goes South? What, uh, what do you do? So Kalani's helped me on the disposition side of the challenge, right? And she hasn't gone through the rigmarole that is real estate. And uh, honestly, the bullshit that happens every day, all of your highs, then all of your lows. <laughs> I think day. you need to practice <laughs> stoicism consistently if you want to yeah. stay sane in entrepreneurship, but especially in real estate. Because like, Dean, the conversations we were talking about the other day, this person's fucking pissed off. They're going to sue you at 8 a.m., and then at nope. 9 15, everything's okay. But then at 9 30, another seller's like, You piece of shit. How could you do this to me? Right. Yep. And so you just have to practice stoicism. Never count on any deal. You always want to get as many deals in the pipeline for me, I think is a big thing from like a diversification standpoint. Cause you just don't want to be betting on like, Hey, this one deal is going to change my life. You want to keep a bunch of deals in that pipeline, keep it full so you aren't stressing out. And then never count on the money. So the money's there. I think that is the number one thing because you're going to go out. You're going to take yourself to a nice steak dinner because this deal's about to close tomorrow. And then some Joe Schmoes, you're like, no, fuck you. We're not signing. We're not doing it. And you're supposed to make six figures and then it just doesn't go through. And mm -hmm. it happens all the time. So I say, if it is going south, be prepared. As soon as you get it signed to the deal, 60% it will close, 40% it won't. You are okay with either way. And then if it does start to go south, I think, Dean, you do the best at handling it professionally, right? Because we had a deal that was going to be a six-figure assignment, and they were like, hey, we want to go with someone else. I was like, you signed a fucking contract. No, but it was in <laughs> Chicago, and so I couldn't do anything because they have three days for their attorney to review no matter what, right? And so on day three, they emailed us. It was worth 300000 and we bought it for 100000 We had an appraisal at 200000 for the property. I was like, but we're going to make good money on this. And then, bam, 
just like that. They have a, the they have a three day period where they can change their mind. Oh, they have a three day because I their attorney emailed me. And I was like, no, we have a legally binding document. Like, we're not doing this. I'm going to file a memorandum on the property. And then he's like, well, we have three days. And then I asked around and they have three days. Yeah. Brutal. So yeah, I, there's lots that go into this, but I think Dean, <laughs> you talking about how you handle it um, professionally. But for me, you just can't rely on the one deal and you need to be prepared and just stay even keel throughout the whole time. I think as things get south, Dean has, is at a point in his business to where he has so much brand equity that he could lose if a deal goes south. If you're a new person, I tell you to hold their fucking feet to the fire, right? Because you don't really have a lot of brand equity to lose. Dean no. has a lot of brand equity to lose. And so it's kind of, you got to see where you're at. And Dean, I think you should tell one of the little stories and how you handled it. Because for a newer person, if you do have the money, I'd hold their feet to the fire. If it's a commercial deal, I am for sure holding their feet to the fire. Cause I know I would honestly get my knees cut off if I tried to renege on a deal on a commercial. Yeah. Dude, we, I mean, literally I have three stories I can tell right now that have all happened in the past two weeks. Um, you know, the first day I got back from Europe, uh, I, I wake up the next morning and I wake up to a better business bureau complaint. And I was like, what, what is this? You know, like I'm used to getting, uh, you know, people leaving reviews and positive things. And I got a complaint, the first one we've ever had. And I was just like, taken back. And to me, you know, each person is going to be different to me that weighs heavy, so heavy on me. Cause like I've, I've told you before, uh, I think privately strat, like integrity, like people's opinion of me, um, you know, all those kind of things weigh on me so heavy. And, uh, to me for someone to say like, Hey, you did something wrong. I'm like, dude, I'm always trying to do something right. How could you say that? Like, that's just, attacking my character. So anyways, better business bureau complaint. Wake up to that. I know, I know what the situation is. This was a situation where two plus years ago, we had a deal under contract. The seller decided not to sell right at the finish line and, you know, can't make the seller sell, but we can hold them to our original legal binding agreement that we both signed and, and decided to move forward with. So we we filed a memorandum on these two properties. And what ended up happening was a year and a half, two years later, seller wants to sell. The memorandum gets seen at escrow. The conversation is had, hey, if, if you want this to go away, we can either buy the properties at the same price like we agreed, or you could pay for them to go away, right? It's, I mean, we have, we have equitable, equitable interest in these properties. So there was some communication that didn't happen well back and forth because I wasn't really involved and I, I left it to, to the team. What ended up happening with a lack of communication, the seller got frustrated because the issue wasn't handled. Um, so he hired an attorney. The attorney reached out to me, knows me personally, said, hey, we're going to put you on the five o'clock news if you don't get this removed. And I said, it's not worth the brand to fight over these deals. We'll go ahead and sign off. We signed off. Well, the paperwork wasn't signed off correctly. The attorney prepared the documents with some wording that the title company didn't like. So there was a delay in getting it removed and getting the liens removed. So the uh, long the, the short story at the, to kind of wrap it up was the, the seller got so frustrated and was causing all this anxiety in their life, as he put it, that he went and just felt he had no other choice. He filed a Better Business Bureau complaint. So I picked up the phone immediately. I had a conversation with the seller immediately, completely diffused the situation, realized that it was miscommunication. We're on the same page. I was more than willing and able to remove the liens. Let's get things back on track. He removed his complaint. I had the attorneys prepare the correct documentation and it was resolved. So that's, that's an example of not having good communication and the problems that can happen. Two other examples. One specifically, uh, we had a seller that was getting frustrated. They wanted to sell us this house. We weren't able to sell it. The reason we weren't able to sell it is because the tenant had pulled a gun out on two different people trying to go view the property and get pictures. Two different people, the tenant pulling a gun. 
Uh, the seller is more than aware that the tenant is violent, uh, had filed the eviction, started it, but was wondering why we hadn't closed yet. Again, there wasn't enough communication up to this point until I saw messages coming through resimply saying, hey, if you don't close um, and stick with our original agreement, I'm going to post negative reviews all over social media. And if I can get you legally, I will. Now that's a, that's a frustrated seller. Okay. Um, again, another lesson of having better communication throughout that process where there was a little gap and delay while we're trying to figure out if we can make this deal work. So I got on the phone with my team and I said, Hey, look, we're going to call the seller back today. And this is exactly what we're going to say. We're going to say, Hey, Mrs. Seller, I completely understand where you're coming from. I understand that you're frustrated. And if I was in your shoes too, I would be frustrated. I'm, I'm, you know, you're looking to sell this house. The, the tenant is, you know, being violent and causing problems. You're trying to evict them. Uh, you're trying to buy this other mobile home and it just hasn't closed yet. And you're frustrated. And look, our intent from the beginning has been to close this deal and, and make it happen for both parties. That's been our intent from the beginning, but, our team having a gun pulled on them really spooked them. And, you know, they're not feeling safe right now. And uh, I've tried to keep pushing it through and, and make it happen. But, um, you know, the team's thinking, what happens if we close on the property and the tenant comes back to the property and, and is violent still? What happens if they trash the property before? So, look, th this is what we're thinking, okay? Um, we know you have the sheriff, lo sheriff lockout. We know that that's going to cost money to, to finalize as a sign of good faith, we'd like to go ahead and just cover those costs for you and just agree that this isn't the right fit. Um, seller was completely cool with us. Uh, they understood our perspective. They, they appreciated our understanding. Um, it sounded like they had a plan B and potential other buyer they were exploring. They, they go ahead, they went ahead and let us know to cancel escrow. Um, and they said, no, 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 you don't have to pay for that. But naturally we, we insisted, um, they, they gave us their Venmo information and we sent it. So that is, uh, an example about how, if you're not careful, you can ruin your brand. Like it takes uh, a lifetime to build a reputation, but it takes five minutes to ruin it. Right. There's, there's all sorts of quotes like that. So, um, so that was the way we handled that. And lastly, the example I'll give, there's a deal where it started to go sideways. We were all ready to close. The seller was prepared to sign and the seller canceled their signing appointment. Okay. Uh, well, what's the reason? Well, the seller wasn't answering their phone at first. So we ended up having to let them know, Hey, look, we have a legal binding contract. We don't want to do this, but if we have to reach out to our attorney to, uh, to, you know, get, get your response, um, that, that might be something we have to do. Well, she responded and said, Hey, let's not get all too excited and fired up here. You know, I'm, I'm having, uh, second thoughts, if I want to sell this, I have a lot of sentimental, va sentimental value. And I also did receive a higher offer from a friend. Okay. Well, the truth came out, right? There's a higher offer from a friend. So we ended up um, getting on the phone with her and finding out that, um, you know, she said it wasn't about the money and it was about the sentimental value. And, uh, for me, the reality is when you're, you're doing these transactions is it takes a lot of time, effort, resources, and some uh, oftentimes hard money that goes money. into Actual our investment money, yeah. to, to even be in the position to buy this deal. Right. Cause the, the point that the seller was making was, Hey, Dean, um, have you guys really incurred any costs? There's no harm, no foul here. And I'm like, we've passed up on opportunities. We've, we've pass up on other projects for our crews to do. So they're counting on this money, right? Our team has invested their time and effort on this deal and, and counting on the commissions from it. Like there is serious hard costs that are going to be affected if we don't move forward with our original agreement. So we went back and forth, gave the seller her time. And ultimately, as a result of me jumping on the phone with the seller and having those conversations, were able to get on the same page uh, as best as we could. And she signed on this past Friday. Closing package just showed up today. It's, we've released a record and we'll make $90,000 on that deal. 
So you didn't have to come up with that chick? I thought you were going to have to go up. Didn't have to go up. And it was a very pivotal point in the conversation because I was prepared to come up and I thought almost guaranteed we were going to have to. And when she said it, it wasn't about the money. Okay. That was a very strong mental note uh, where I, I shifted my approach in the conversation. And then she did ask, Hey, is there just a number that I can pay you to make this go away and allow me to, to sell it to my friend? Okay. Now, mind you, her offer from her friend was $75,000 more than ours. So would it be reasonable to say, just pay us 75,000 potentially, but on paper, we were, we were due to make more. And again, the point that is, that is important and that I made is it's not just us. There's other downstream impacts from other people that are involved and in counting on this, like dozens of people. Right. Um, so if we, if we back out on our deal, then there's all these other people that are impacted. So when she asked me, what's the number I, I hesitated and I paused and I said, look, if you really want me to pencil out the number and I had, I was prepared to give a number. I said, if you really want me to pencil out the number I could, but my concern is that it's actually going to be higher than the difference of what your friend even offered. And she said, oh, I had a feeling you would say that and uh, this, that, and, and she was kind of going back and forth, you know, on where things were at. And ultimately it was, okay, give me some time and let me think about this. And so, uh, we gave her a couple more days. You. Look at that yeah. wordsmith right there, bro. Well, I'm like, you, way dude. to put that the right way. I've, I've leaned heavily into human psychology as of late in order to phrase something a slightly different way to get the yeah. desired outcome of that conversation. Yeah. I'm telling you right now, it's, it's everything. And, um, and I've practiced a lot on that. This just comes from experience. Trust me when I say I started out with none of these skills, like, uh, I'd say I'm still lacking in, in many communication skills, but man, none of these skills exist. So this is just from like putting in the grind for over a decade. But, um, th those are the most valuable skills that you grow is how to problem solve, how to communicate with others and how to go get the outcome you're looking for. Um, so yeah, it, it played out and, um, thankfully it all, it all went, it went well. The Jason, only thing I'll add, yeah, here's the only thing I'll add, man, is, um, I think when a big mistake I see investors making when deals start falling apart is there's hesitation to lean into the problem and face it head on. And the longer that you just drag things out, the longer that we're radio silence with the sellers and all the other parties, the worse the outcome is going to become for you guys. So you have to lean into having a very difficult conversation. And here's the framework that I would use if you've never been in this type of position before. Number one, I think you just have to decide whether or not you're at a stage of the deal where you are willing to walk away or not. I think that's the very first problem that you need to solve for. So like, is it very early on and is there a legitimate reason? And do you feel okay with just saying, hey, I'm gonna cut ties with the deal. I'm sure all of us on this call, I know I have. I've been in situations where I was just like, you know what, for one reason or another, it just made sense to, you know, just part ways and that makes sense. So I think you have to decide that. Number two, yeah. if you're not walking away and the train's already left the station and it's not coming back, you need to have that conversation immediately. And for me, it looks like a three way approach is usually there's one of three outcomes that are going to happen, right? You're either going to end up coming up and offering a little bit more money to get the deal done. Seller is going to pay you to get out. The seller or some other party involved is going to pay you to walk away from the deal or you're just gonna hold your guns and you're gonna go down the road of litigation. It's usually like one of those three things, right? So I think your discussion with the seller is laying all of those three options out at the table and just being as honest as transparent as where you can be and what your position is with the sellers. Because I know, and we talked about this because we've had this discussion about the deal that you're just talking about, Dean. It's like, what if that role was reversed, Mrs. Seller, right? And let's yep. say you had moved out of your house and let's say you were already at the next place you were going. And it was the day before we were going to close and you were expecting to get 
a big chunk of cash wired over to your bank account in 24 hours. And I picked up the phone and I was like, hey, you know what? Um, I had another seller give me the opportunity to buy a house. It turned out to be a better deal than the property that I'm working on with you. So I'm going to cancel this deal and I'm going to go buy this house and said, sorry, have a great day. No harm, no foul, right? That wouldn't work either. We would get absolutely dragged in the mud for doing something like that, right? And so not to like rehash everything that Dean said, but I think you need to be very clear about, hey, once we sign a legal contract and we have an equitable interest in this deal, if we're not, nobody here on this call, I believe, wants to go down the road of litigation. We don't want to sue. We don't want any of that stuff. But no. it does reach a point where we've got bills, we've got team members, we've got families to take care of. We have lots of responsibilities. There's lots of costs associated with getting us to that stage. And you just need to be open and honest with the sellers about what the options are and lay them out on the table and try your best to come to a, a reasonable solution that works for everybody. And I've seen all three things happen. Literally, Right now, last week, I had a seller pay me $20,000, dude. That was, I've never seen that before. They paid me $20,000 just to walk away from the deal. We laid out the options. I said, hey, I can come up or you can pay me X or we can go down this road. And she said, you know what? I, I'm just going to pay you the 20000 because we want to do something else with the house. And then they cut us a check the next day for twenty grand. i have had plenty of situations where we've given in a little bit and paid the seller some more to keep the deal together. And we have a few now where we filed list pendences on and we're working on a couple where it took that to get the seller to come back to the negotiating table. They tried to take a hard line with us. They wouldn't talk with us. And as soon as that paperwork hit and they got filed out of nowhere, you know, now we can have a conversation. And sometimes you got to explore all three options, but don't wait to have difficult conversations. Yeah. Time is your enemy with these, these kind of issues. Mm -hmm. Um, Strat, before you you jump in, I had a question from Fernando on IG. He says, what happens when your buyer bails on the deal the day of close of escrow? That's what you happened. You put his name morning. in our Facebook group and you burn <laughs> him forever. I, I, For me, I do. Jason showed me how a buyer should operate. And this was my first deal on my own in Fresno. And I we tell this story all the time. But I sold this little shit box tin can that looks like this right there but just smaller right it's it uh, essentially bro it was held together by twigs and spiders <laughs> and me and jason walk it and jason's like strap <laughs> this is not what i thought it was bro but i told you i'm gonna buy it i'm gonna fucking buy it and i'm gonna figure it out yeah and i i only made five grand but that five grand at that point in time in my life was a big five fucking grand and it goes leaps and bounds, at least in our community. We are so tight knit to where if someone doesn't perform for one reason or another, especially if they're just trying to drag you out, to me, it rubs me the wrong way. Because you have yeah. a long time to try and hash something out. Um, Dean, the deal me and you did down in um, Taft, Shane, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Shane calls me like, hey, bro, I've never had to back out on a deal before. I'm going to, I need to back out on this. And I was like, all right, cool. Here's how I always handle this. If I can't find another buyer, I'm keeping your MD because I'm going to have to give some to the seller. Yeah, That's just the way it is. If not, bro, if I can find another buyer, all good. Keep going on your way. Thank you for calling me as soon as you knew. Again, like how Jason said, as soon as like something comes up, just have the hard conversation. Yeah, He called me on a Sunday. He was like, hey, bro, I just got stuff back from my contractor. I'm not comfortable. I already have EMD in, but like I'd I want to back out. If you need to keep my EMD, do it. And so for someone to wait until the closing day to back out to me is fisticuffs. Yeah. At this point. No, like, it's tough. Unacceptable. I think earnest money, you're keeping the earnest money no matter what. So your earnest money should be hard in a relatively short amount of time when you're assigning to an end buyer. You got to make sure that they get that in sooner rather than later, especially if it's somebody you've never actually done a deal with before and they don't have a strong track record or reputation. But at that stage, I agree. I think you're keeping the earnest money. Um, and I, I'm not saying that your default should be to close on the deal yourself. But I think the way that you mitigate a lot of risk in your business is by running an operation where you either have the cash or the working capital to perform if you need to. And more importantly, you've underwritten the deal at a place where it actually makes sense to buy. And you're not just tying it up, throwing it out there, and you know crossing your fingers and hoping somebody closes on it right and so we ended up having to do that with the deal in selma last month where literally same exact thing we had it assigned 
We had to wait 30 days because there was a lost note bond that we had to file. We assigned it right away. Buyer put their earnest money in. We're awaiting the 30 day cooling off period for that lost note bond to clear. When we get ready to close a couple days, the guy was like, I can't even remember what happened, but he came up with some reason that he told the team and said, dude, I can't do this. And I ended up buying it. I just ended up closing on it. I stuck it on the market. We cleaned it out. We wholetailed it. We made a few bucks. I cleaned my, I claimed the EMD back. We kept it and moved on and called it a day. I think your, your reputation out here, both as a buyer and a seller is paramount to everything mm -hmm. else. And if, if you can't perform like that, you need to let the seller know immediately. I think possibly releasing the EMD to them is something that you should be open to and then work your ass off to figure out a way to find somebody else to, to step in and, and replace if you don't have the means to do it yourself. I think the EMD thing is big. Like the big mm -hmm. reason I want hard EMD is so I can give it to the seller because that's what will hold that deal together. 100%. If you need to buy a little bit of time, you release 2,500 bucks or five grand or whatever it is that your earnest money is. Yeah. I mean, that's a sign of good faith to the seller that you're doing yeah. everything that you can do. So I, I like that option a lot. Yeah. What I would add to that. Um, so I just had one of my students close a deal today where the seller two days in a row, two business days in a row, drug his feet and was giving him all the feelings like this deal was going to fall out. Okay. And so this, this is what I, I walked through with him. So Friday, the deal was supposed to close. Title and escrow had everything that they needed to close. The buyer just needed to, to send his funds. So uh, my, my student texted me on Friday, said, dude, the buyer just straight up didn't send his funds. What should I do? Like he said he was going to, didn't send his funds. Like, what should I do? And the way that I would approach the situation is first is try to reestablish communication with the buyer, right? Like this isn't a seller who a seller naturally selling a property, maybe the only property they've ever sold in their life, right? Uh, has typically more sentimental value. A buyer, you would imagine who's buying a property, a distressed property, this one being in Sacramento, uh, a six a $650,000 purchase price, you know, that's like, that's not an everyday thing. So you would think they'd be professional, they'd be experienced, they'd have decent communication. I said, look, we got to, we got to reach out. Um, and we got to connect and, and make sure we have communication, blow the person up if you have to, like, if they're not responding to you, get some sort of a response. And if they're not going to respond from just a call or a text, then let them know where things stand. Like, Hey, um, we were supposed to close this day. You didn't send the funds. If I don't hear back from you on Monday, I'm going to assume you're not moving forward and I'm going to move on to the next buyer. And as a result, I'm going to keep your EMD, right? That's the kind of next steps conversation you can have if you're not getting a response. So he was able to get a response from the buyer. The buyer said, yes, I'm going to send funds on Monday. Okay. Now the life is an entrepreneur roller coaster. There was a dopamine hit, felt good, felt like things were fine. EM, the, the money isn't received on Monday before the wire cut off. What the heck? No response, hits the buyer up again. The buyer then says, yeah, I sent the funds. Well, he sent it after the wire cut off, didn't give any confirmation, had no communication during the day, even sit, though he said he was going to send the funds. So now it's a question of, well, is he going to close tomorrow? Are the fun, were the funds really sent? So during the weekend... And this is my recommendation. If a buyer is going south, I like to keep track of all the buyers that were interested in the deal in my spreadsheet. I keep a little spreadsheet of all of our active deals. And then when we send a deal out, anybody who's interested, I put their name down every single time. Every person interested, if they even mention a price, I'm putting the price next to their name because we have had deals where the buyer pulls out at the last second. And we had a deal just two weeks ago where the buyer pulled out last second and within 24 hours, the same day I was able to get a new buyer, get them to send everything they needed to escrow and to wire the funds the next morning and close that next day. Less than 24 hours, get a new buyer and close the deal. And that was only because I was prepared and That's kept track cool. of all the people who were interested. That was the only reason that happened. If I had to go back and resend the deal out and see who else was interested it would have been a whole thing that was stressful. So anytime you send a deal out, you take everybody that's interested. And in that situation where a buyer's going south, you don't blast it out, in my opinion. You start talking to the people who are interested 
and vet out who's really serious and who could take action quickly. Um, and then if that buyer ultimately just fails, then I, I make it clear that it's done and, and see if there's almost like a second chance and they respond with some sort of conviction that convinces me they're going to get it done. Um, and then, and then I just take action with the next buyer. So that's how I would handle that. Um, are you and, getting uh, something in writing from the guy you have it assigned to like a formal cancellation? Usually and, or not. are you just moving? No, you're not. So you usually not. I, usually it's I verbal. thought that I, right now. And I would, cause I know you're trying to move quick. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But yeah, you are a little bit exposed. I think if you don't have something that totally closes that loop on that other end. And so I agree. For everybody that's on here, even if they're dragging their feet, right? You're better off having something in writing just to cover your ass because you don't want that guy to roll up and crawl up, up from under some other rock like later on down the road and try to sue you because you said you sold your deal to somebody else. So Yo, Jason, did you ever hear from homeboy who ghosted you? He did. <laughs> yeah, he messaged me. I tracked him down on Facebook and he messaged me and... uh Basically, long story short, he said that the guy that they signed the contract with did not have an actual interest to sell the property. So after title pulled it, it didn't excuse all the non-communication for three weeks. But uh, no, that's ultimately like, what he told me. Wait, wait, what was his reason? That it was he a said daisy that the, the No, he said that the seller wasn't a daisy chain or what he well, he could have been, but what he told me was that he said that the seller, the person that was supposedly the seller that they inked the contract with. Once the prelim came back in, he was they not the guy. He was not. He did not have the legal authority to sell it. Uh, so there was either a probate issue, some other stuff that needed to go on, and ultimately, it looks like that one's dead. Damn, and that one happens too. The that money, happens. The money is never going to be there until it's there. That's all yep. I will say. Between title issues, buyers and sellers, there's. Yes, you can make a lot of money in real estate, but you got to get a lot of people to all work in the right direction to get there. True. And yeah. you're, another thing, guys, is you're going to have deals just by doing sheer volume. Law of averages is going to work itself out. There's going to be deals that fall apart for other reasons besides the seller being able to like come out. Like out of, You said you locked up 20 last month, right, Dean, for June? 20 yeah. new contracts? Yeah. What is your guys' fallout rate right now? Like, What do you guys think Like, out of, out of 10... How many will fall out just because of like title issues or insert whatever thing? Like, what are you guys typically dealing with? Because you guys have been doing volume for a while. So right now for the year, let me look at my my other spreadsheet here. So our success rate right now, um, and this this will be updated with potential several other deals that fall out. Right now we have. Um, let me write this down. Right now we have a ninety percent. Uh, just to give a round number, 90% success rate, meaning 10% of the deals fall out. One out of 10 deals fall out. Um, could that potentially, 80? what's that? I feel like you, do you want to be like 80, 85, like how we were talking about earlier? I yeah, mean, you're doing, you're doing that. really good if you're at that number. Yeah. Um, that's a great and, number for my understanding. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think people who, you know, for, you know, who, who are sitting there saying, I'm doing a ton of deals, I'm doing it nationwide or not. Uh, I think it's common for 60 to 70% to fall out, you know, well, we are at um, a 50% completion right now and we are at 30 contracts. Yeah. Like we're at like a travel. We are a true nationwide Timbuktu hillbilly town. Can we get this thing moved? We're that at makes 50% it even to where like we tell them like, Hey, we're going to take a stab at this, but you are in the middle of nowhere. So we might not close on this if our finance team doesn't want to do it. And that's yeah, how yeah. you kind of have to brace it. But I, everyone I know who does national stuff, they're at a 60% close rate. Eric Klein, when we were talking to him, what was it? Like three months ago, he was like, I want to be at 80% because some other people could go in just a little bit more and take a stab at it. And we were leaving 30 grand on the table every month that we could have been capturing. And so that's why I was asking, like, did you want to be a little bit lower? Because 90, I think, is great. Yeah, I think I think ninety is good. I think um, the number will over the year as time continues and some of these deals potentially fall out. Uh, it may go just a smidge smidge lower. Uh, Greg Helbeck says, "Yo, homies, what's up, Greg?" What's up, Greg? Um, I, I think what it boils down to is a: Are you 
getting the deals under contract at the right numbers, not trying to force deals. Okay. That substantially will increase your success rate. And I think we've done a very good job at doing that. Um, we've been really intentional about making sure the numbers work. And when you do deal after deal after deal, you, you see what the market is telling you. The market will tell you, are you getting the deals at the right price? It's, again, if you're focused on wholesaling a lot of deals, the market's going to tell you if you're getting the deals at the right price. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is um, there's going to be title issues that are completely out of your control. So, we had a deal yeah. that we got under contract. We were going to make 20000 on it. Another wholesaler brought a buyer. Uh, actually, one of my students, Brian. Brian had another buyer. He added $20,000 on top. We were each going to make 20. It turns out the person we were working with, the seller, was actually the craphead grandson squatting in the property, not the actual legal person able to sell the property. It's like, yep. okay, crap. So um, that's a title issue with who owns the property and has the right to sell it. And then there's other title issues that we could name a whole bunch that are going to squash the deal. So some of those are going to be natural fallout. We've tried to really reduce the amount of the fallout. And then the Timbuktu properties, man, I feel like are uh, somewhat of a gamble. Sometimes you mm -hmm. hit the mark and you found the right one, right area, had the right buyer at the right time. And then other times it's crickets and it's really tough. And those right. are the other ones that, that, uh, that influence and impact deals that, that fall out there. I bet you we move to 60 to 80 by implementing all these novations. Cause if like, you don't have novations doing what we're doing, like it, it's impossible. Yeah. And we essentially yeah, which, just tell what you're doing. Yeah. Greg says, uh, Strat, I got a junk guy going out to our little, uh, Genesee, Genesee house to clean it out. Going to cost us two to three K to get it, get all the rubble out. All right. Me and Greg got two novations going right now. And one, both of these are in like Timbuktu towns in New York. I'm about to say these are these are like in the sticks in New York or what? Yeah, one of them's in like the middle of nowhere, New York, to where we had it at one price. We and then we sent over an agent. We had to go get a reduction because the house is trashed, and that's what that junk thing Greg's talking about. And Greg then, said, uh, "Let me join the live. This is his favorite topic." <laughs> and then our other one is um. Uh, I, our seller just had a stroke. We um, have it for thirty. We're gonna put it on the market for ninety. I think. I don't. I don't even know the exact numbers. There's a couple. You just said ago. that other dude had a stroke. He's getting the paperwork we need. We have been in this one. Yeah. So I mean, again, it takes a lot of things going the right way to get something to the finish line. Yeah. A lot of moving parts. Um. Let's see our next question. Okay. Next question is about, um, do you niche down or spread out and diversify? So this, this topic is really interesting to me. Um, because man, there's so many shiny objects, so many shiny objects. There's so many ways to make a buck. Um, and specifically if we're talking about real estate, there's so many different strategies that you can implement. There's different asset classes that you can be involved in, single family, multifamily, commer uh, commercial, retail, um, office, there's industrial, so many different asset classes and strategies within each. So the question is, I'll, I'll open back to you guys. What do you guys feel um, resonates for you? What's working for you and what you believe in now or big picture or what you want to do in the future? Do you believe in niche down or spreading out, diversifying? Do you want me to go first? Yeah, let's hear you go first. I'll go. go ahead. I think at the beginning, you need to really niche down to master the skill. Business is honestly just sets of skills that no other people have that you can use to make money. So like, as soon as we diversify, we enter in a new field where we're the dumb shit. And I'd say there's a two to three year learning curve to get to be adamant to make money in that field. For example, like when we started Call Magicians, I had no large call center skills. I had no actual internet marketing skills. I had no large leadership skills. Like there's all these things that are in like that type of diversification I didn't have that took a long time to learn and then eventually monetize. I think for most people, 
you should not even really consider sub two. It is not a viable business model. Right. I think you should worry about novations and wholesale. If you are in a market that's a major metro, you should just worry about wholesale and then do your thing. If you're trying to invest, everyone I know who's in commercial, they specialize in the type of commercial and they may have a little bit of diversification when they get there. So like Ian has a million dollar, a million square feet of self storage. And then he has some mixed use commercial and he has some apartments, but I'd say 80% of his portfolio is self storage facilities. I just think up until you get a ton of money coming in and you have the people leverage and you feel like that business is sustainable, there should be no diversification. And I think the people leverage is huge. And then the skill leverage is huge. Yeah. What do you think, Jason? I'm a big fan of, of deeper, not wider. I think, um, I think every time I've tried to cast a wider net without becoming a true expert or really getting a uh, solid footing on whatever it is that I'm doing now, I've, I've kind of burned my hand on the, on a hot oven, man. You gotta be really careful with that. And so, um, we talk a lot about distractions, shiny object syndrome, and real estate is one of those business was businesses where there's shiny object syndromes coming up all the time, creative financing, novations. I mean, we've seen it just in the last seven to 10 years, all these different exit strategies that are there, right? And if we're too quick to move from one thing to another or implement one thing, and we're not great at our core competency, um, I think the core business is going to struggle. So I'm a big believer in keep the main thing, the main thing, uh, go deeper initially, and then you know, be slower to implement some of these shiny object things. And I think, um, you know, that helps you become more sustainable and have a business that will be more predictable over the long term. Because there is Stratton, I think you said it, dude, there's a learning curve, even for us as experienced yeah. people, right? Like if I wanted to go out and novate a deal right now, there's going to be a learning curve for me. Now, I know more of the puzzle pieces that I think that I would than maybe somebody that's brand new. But all of that time, effort, and energy to try to put all of that together, download all that stuff to my team, manage my team throughout that process, that's going to suck up time and energy for me for other things. And so um, I think go deeper first and then cast a wider net. That, I mean, if you want to implement it into your sales process, that's a month, in my opinion. Like if you're really going to like do it, commit to it, that's a month out of the year of getting the marbles out of your team's mouth having them pitch it the right way, having the confidence when they pitch it, right? Like all these steps that go into it to where, I don't know, for most people, I don't think you should diversify. Warren Buffett, I think the majority of his holdings are Apple. That's, yeah, and Coca-Cola, I think a lot too. Yeah, it's, it's like, like 4,000 shares or something like that. What are your Crazy. thoughts, you know? Uh, so... I'm going to echo a lot of what you guys said. Um, you know, I, I too, like Jason said, I, I've, I've tried to branch out and get into other things and it's the learning curve, the learning curve of trying to get up to speed and, and be able to be in the position to add value and to know what the deal looks like and feels like in something different than what you've been practicing and training at and getting skilled out and spending all the time to, to be in the position to find success uh, really is distracting in my opinion. And look, there's some people that are really great at being in several different businesses and different industries and owning many different companies. And I think really the, the truth of that is they, they're just skilled at finding the right people to help support those. I, 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 I don't think it's them being so great at all those different things. And, and maybe there's some unicorns out there, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to say that for me, it's always been a bigger reward. The more that I've gotten focus, I've doubled down, I've tripled down, I've stayed in my lane and continued to put more effort there. Uh, it's only gotten better results. And I think, you know, June uh, is just a, a perfect example. I spent 30 days in Europe from the beginning of May through the beginning, through, uh, um, mid, so mid May to mid June. And, and during that time, our business, uh, didn't, didn't fall back. It, it only increased and, uh, got better. And I think that's a testament of just, um, continuing to stay focused and, and support the team and put them in the position to win and, um, and do my part as well. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm all with you guys on, uh, how you guys feel about that too. 
the only way I was ever able to do anything else was with new team members and very, very competent team members. Yeah. Yeah. When people aren't doing the the right thing, uh, it makes things worse. And we talked about that when you're a small business owner and you don't have, you know, layers of different managers and it's on you to not only get the job done, but then train the person. And I mean, that's, that's going to time suck and, and pull you back and you'll be stuck, you know? So yeah, you're doing double the work at that part. point, dude. You're not, you're, yeah. you're showing your team how to do it and you're most likely doing it while your team is observing you yeah. do it. Right. So it's yeah. like, it's a double whammy almost dude. You know what I'm saying? Cause you gotta, you can't just go and knock it out really quick. You've got to go in a way where they can learn and absorb it. And most people aren't just going to pick it up. Uh, the very first time. So that means you're going to have to do that over and over and over again until the point where you can actually delegate. So yeah, be mindful. Be mindful of that for sure. Should we let Greg come on real quick? Let's see if he's still on there. Greg, if you're still on, uh, send a message in my IG. Let me know you're still there. So we'll send you the link. It'll pop in. What was the next question? I thought we had a good one. Yeah, next question here is, uh, we got a, a couple different good questions. So how do you learn? How do you learn? What are the different ways that you receive information that you get better? Uh, what's what's the way that you do that? I want to hear Jason first. I want to hear Jason's while we wait here for Grego. The learning process for me has been an evolution, dude, especially since I got into the real estate business. I mean, I think the way that I learned at the beginning was just through self-education, honestly, because I didn't have money or resources to, to really do anything else. So a lot of it was free information on the internet, lots of trial and error, rinse and repeat as much as I can until I started to gain uh, some level of mastery over this thing. And then over time, what the, the way that I prefer to learn now is model other successful people. So get myself in proximity to other people that are doing what I wanna do, whether I need to pay to do that or just you know, travel or network or however I have to facilitate that. Um, I want to be in as close proximity to other people as I can that are doing what I want to do. I want to figure out how they got to that point and model that behavior, either through hiring them as a coach, hiring them as a consultant or whatever, you know, whatever the, the shortest way for me is now speed is the most important thing for me at, at the beginning. I couldn't pay for speed. So I didn't have the money or the resources to do it. So it was just grit and just hard work. Now we're fortunate that the business is in a place where we can pay for speed and I'd rather just pay for that information and get easy access to implementation. What about you, Strat? Let me turn my, down my AC real quick. I had to make sure it was low. Um, for me, like the framework I use is what is the problem I'm trying to solve? And then am I lacking a skill that's required to solve that problem? Or like, am I the problem? You know, like, so like, let's say for this wholesale stuff on this challenge, I was like, geez, man, we really aren't moving a lot of these contracts. We're getting, we're getting so many leads. We have to monetize them somehow. What is the issue I'm having? Okay. Well, I'm not able to sell them. What's the best way in order for me to be able to sell them? I identify that problem. And then I go, okay, what's the skill I need to go do that? And then I'll go deep dive on the internet read books and then pay someone to help me with it. Right. And so like for this one, I was like, all right, novations. I called three different people. I know who did novations. I had hour long conversations with them. I do a deal with Greg. I do a deal with another guy. I'm like, Hey, I want to be on every email. I want to hear every phone call. I want to hear every sales pitch just so I have this down. And then we went and we implemented it the next week. We locked up a novation the same week and we'll probably lock up three more this week, but it's identifying what that problem is. And then, okay, how do I need to solve that? And then going and getting all the information I need. And then I learn a lot with, I read a lot of books. Like I read a lot of books. And then I listen to a lot of podcasts of people who I think have done really cool shit. Because if I can see the issues that they've gone through and issues they've had on like the types of things they've grown, my little issues, you'll generally pull out some gems from these really good entrepreneurs. And I'm not talking about like your internet influencers but the dudes who've really gone out and built iconic shit. Like one of my favorite podcasts is this podcast called Founders. And he, he just does hour long biography reads of the greatest entrepreneurs and leaders of all time. And one of them is this man named the banana man, Sam 
Zamuri. And he overthrew like the Venezuelan government to take over the world banana trade. And like all the stuff that he did during that time and like the way he structured things and mitigated risk, you can learn lots of stuff from that. And so that's how I was. Yeah, for me, I, I, I wish that either I had better time management or I just don't know if it's possible reality with four kids and, you know, multiple businesses and stuff. If I can have a bunch of free time to sit and, and listen and learn and, and do those kind of things could, could be an excuse, but part of it's just reality of the, the circus that, uh, that I live in over here. But I feel like I learn best when I go to events and I'm in a room with other people that are there to learn and share. And, um, when I'm there at those events, not only do I, I learn and absorb a ton from whatever speaker is presenting or, or whatever the, the topic is or mastermind is, but it's the hallway conversations that I have with the right person, right? Cause not everybody is, is willing and able to share. Um, but I know that's one of the things that we preach a lot is just abundance mindset, sharing and collaborating and, and there's enough deals for all of us. So when you find the right person who's similar and maybe doing a strategy that you're not, or doing a strategy that you're doing better, um, or doing it differently, having those hallway conversations and bouncing that kind of, uh, feedback between one another to me has been some of the most valuable stuff that I've had over the years. And it's not usually what you expect. Like when you go to those events, usually it's not that conversation that you went there for, but it's the unexpected conversation that probably holds, holds more value than anything else. And it's, it's in the hallways, it's sitting down for lunch and uh, going with a couple of different people and then having just some chit chat. And it's uh, it's those kind of things that uh, going to your local meetup um, that that is held uh, that that is the stuff that is the game changing information I receive and I get inspired. Um, I, I pick up new puzzle pieces that allow me to connect the dots and then go implement. Uh, to me, that's that's how I love to learn and is more exciting than me sitting down and reading a book. Reading a book is is a romantic idea. I love 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 the idea of it. It just doesn't feel very practical for me. And I usually yeah. fall asleep when I try. That change of say, environment is helpful too, dude. Like, cause you're going yeah. to a place where mentally you, I'm coming to this environment to learn something new, yeah. whether you're just totally. paying travel totally. or you're paying travel and a fee to be in that room or whatever it costs. I think it, it prepares your mind and your brain in a different way to absorb it versus trying to squeeze something in, in the, crazy day-to-day -day stuff that we've got going on because your brain in this environment that i'm in right now it's just work 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 deals right now and i'm not really it's not optimized for me to be like spending time in deep thought learning uh like a new thing you guys know we've got fires going on all the different times so sometimes that change of environment really is required not even helpful it's like required to really absorb that information in a different way totally my last bit if you can pin down someone you want to talk to who's doing cool things and you can ask them questions. That is the best way to learn. That's mm. how I learn a lot. And it's probably like my favorite thing to do is find entrepreneurs who I'm interested in and pin them in a room and make them answer my questions for an hour and a half. Like, that's that's one I of your biggest podcast. skills is asking amazing questions. I got to give you a shout out for that. Um, I saw you at, at the event, the very first event that we all three did together, uh, where Pace Morby was one of the speakers, right? I remember sitting there late night at 11.30 p.m. at the hotel lobby and you just sitting there with great question after great question that you were asking Pace and he was loving it and just, you know, all about it. And for me, I'm thinking, man, these are amazing questions and the information we were getting back was so good. So if you can actually sit people down and I think that's why it's good to have a podcast. We have a great platform. So we got to have like I got to talk to Shamus alone for an hour and a half at the event and i again cool. i pinned him in a room this is before <laughs> the like where he held court and i sat down and i talked to him for like an hour and a yeah. half like that's where i'm going to get a ton of information that you're usually not able to get anywhere else 
and everyone is generally going to open up if you ask questions correctly and you're genuinely curious and it's not just like well what's your morning routine you know yeah. like and it's actually right. something that's meaningful how are like you have to at least understand what they're doing comprehend it and then ask them how if you just want to well how did you avoid this how did you avoid that what do you think about risk all these other things and then they it strokes their ego honestly and they'll keep going and going and going. And it's a great way to build a relationship with a mentor. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, we got several other great questions that we'll hold for next week. I think that's a, uh, that's a wrap for us today. Um, do we want to end with a problem of the week or we want to save that for next time? Jason, you got to hop. Yeah. My problem of the week was the deal fallout thing. As we've grown, We've, we've had more. So just talking through that, I think was a good one for me today. I think we're just going to, it's going to be the natural progression of doing more and more deal flow. It's just going to happen. It's just yeah. a statistical thing. So yeah. Yeah. I got to jump. Cool. All right. You want to call yourself straight? Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I need to say this at the beginning. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe. And everybody who is watching this actively needs to send Sleepy Dean a message saying you need to dress up as Trump. Just say dress up as Trump. That's all I want to say. <laughs> Sleepy Dean will come. If I start to the getting next those pod. in my DMs. I'm just gonna be like, wow. He will come. He will redeem himself next week as the Trumpster. You gotta see what's on Amazon. I'm sure there's We're lots of good, for it. good stuff. So guys, thank yeah. you guys so much for tuning in. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe, and we'll see you next week. Later, guys. Peace.